Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about air brakes in the state of New York for the purposes of getting a CDL, a commercial driver's license. Had a comment from Nate, he was having some difficulty understanding air brakes, and that's little doubt. In terms of getting a driver's license, the air brakes is the most technical and the most difficult for students to understand. There's a lot of information that you need to know, and the state of New York, like many other jurisdictions here in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, are still teaching a 40-year-old air brake course. And just in case, they stick everything in the kitchen sink into these air brake courses, and it serves to simply confuse students. So today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the air brake chapter for the CDL manual in the state of New York, highlight some of the information, give you some further information and tell you stuff that you're just not gonna find on an air brake system anymore. So today, I'm gonna talk to you about air brakes for a CDL license in the state of New York. We'll be right back to talk to you about that. Hi there, smart drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you about air brakes in the state of New York for the purposes of getting a CDL. First and foremost for air brakes, what you need to understand is, is that air brakes are no different than the brakes on your regular car or light truck. The only difference between air brakes and the brakes on your car or light truck is the power source. On a light truck, they're hydraulic brakes, which means that there's hydraulic fluid in there and the pressure created from the pump, which is basically the brake pedal, the master cylinder pushes and the brake shoes inside the hub push out against the hub and bring the vehicle to a stop. Parking brakes on your light truck or vehicle pull up on the handle. It's a ratchet. You use mechanical power from your body to pull that up or you push down with your foot on the floor and it locks in. It's a ratchet set, you know, kind of like on a boat winch, click, 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 click. The parking brake on your vehicle is exactly the same thing. On an air brake system, instead of using hydraulic power, we're using air pressure, which applies the brakes going up and down the road, which we commonly refer to as service brakes. And the parking brakes on a big truck or a bus are applied with spring pressure, which is the mechanical force that we use to apply the brakes indefinitely. Before spring brakes were applied in the late 1960s and early 1970s, a few trailers rolled away, careened down a hill and killed a porta potty. So authorities deemed it necessary that brakes on big trucks and buses needed to be applied indefinitely when the vehicle was left parked. As well, the spring brakes will act as an emergency brake if air pressure in the system drops to unacceptable levels below 60 pounds per square inch. Today we're going to go through the manual and we're going to highlight information for you. I'm on chapter 5 of the CDL manual in the state of New York. The first section talks about air brakes and why we use air brakes on large commercial vehicles. First and foremost, they've proven reliable for more than a century now and are capable of stopping large commercial vehicles and transmitting powerful force over a large distance. So think of a large tractor trailer unit that's almost 75 feet long. The driver can control the brakes from the brake pedal in the cab all the way back to the back of the trailer almost 70 feet away and we have braking force as well. Air brakes are tolerant to leaks. And when I say tolerant to leaks, air brake systems, modern air brake systems are tolerant to fairly large leaks. You can even hear a leak in the cab while you're driving down the road with all the road noise in the diesel engine because all of the air from the air brake system is plumbed through the dash. And you'll be able to hear it long before that low air warning comes on. <laughs> Unless you're drunk, stoned, and asleep, you are going to hear that air leaking out of that system. So pay attention. You're going to know that there's an air leak in the system before you get going down the road. And I really don't advise you to do any of those things while you're driving a large commercial vehicle. Next piece. As it says in the manual, the air brake system comprises of three pieces. The service brakes, which is the normal brakes when you apply the brakes and bring the vehicle to a nice gentle stop coming up to a traffic light or a stop sign or whatnot. The next piece is the parking brakes, which is applied by the springs, powerful springs inside the spring brake chambers that apply the parking brakes. And when there's air in the system, it compresses those springs and allows the service brakes to go up and down the road. If you lose sufficient air pressure inside the system, those springs will come on automatically and then they act as emergency brakes in the event of a power loss. So there's three kinds of brakes, service brakes, parking brakes, and emergency brakes. And parking brakes and emergency brakes are one and the same thing. Large, powerful springs that are held off 
going up and down the road with air pressure. If air pressure is lost, the springs start to come on and the spring brakes will act as emergency brakes. So those are the three kinds of brakes that they're talking about at the beginning of the chapter in chapter five of the New York CDL manual. The next piece is the air compressor. The two pieces that you need to highlight for the air compressor is, is that it's gear driven or belt driven. Believe me, these air compressors haven't been belt driven since the 1970s, but it is a question on the test whether they can be belt driven or gear driven. All compressors in this day and age are bolted right to the side of the engine. They use the air intake from the engine's filter filtration system. They also use the engine's lubricating system. They don't have their own oil supply. I mean, unless it's from the 1970s, the air compressor is gear driven, air cooled, uses the engine's filtration system to bring in air and uses the engine's lubrication system. I'll put up a card here for you for the full video on an air compressor. The next piece is the governor. The governor controls the compressor. In the state of New York, governor cutout pressure is 125 pounds and cut in pressure is 100 pounds per square inch. You need to test whether the governor is working, minimum and maximum pressure, and I'll put a card up here for you for the full video on the governor. One thing I will say about the governor, it works like a thermostat on a furnace. When the temperature in your house goes down to a minimum, the thermostat turns the furnace back on. When the temperature goes back up to a maximum, the thermostat turns the furnace off. A governor in an air brake system works exactly the same. The only difference is, is that the compressor runs the entire time that the engine is running. So instead of turning it off and on, all it does is it loads or unloads. It cuts it in or cuts it out. When it cuts out, it's pumping air into the atmosphere and sitting there and just kind of chug, 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 cooling off. It's like an internal combustion engine without the spark plugs in it. It's just kind of there and cooling off and not really doing anything. Cut in, it's pumping air into the system. That's the job of the governor. Minimum, maximum for the governor. Like I said, there's a full video on the governor here on the channel. Next piece on the air brake system are the air tanks. The air tanks are the first fail safe of the air brake system. There's enough air stored in the air tanks for 10 to 12 full brake applications. Now what you need to know about the air tanks, sometimes called reservoirs, just call them air tanks, is they all have drain valves on them. For the purposes of the air brake test, we drain the air tanks daily, daily, daily because hot air comes out of the compressor, it cools inside the tanks, and when it cools, you get moisture inside the tanks. Think of it like a drink with ice cubes in it in the summertime. The glass is cold, the hot air comes in contact with the glass. And what happens is the water vapor inside the air condenses into a liquid and forms water droplets on the outside of the glass. That's exactly what happens inside an air tank when the hot air from the compressor goes into the air tank. Thus, they have to be drained every day. Most air tanks will have manual drain valves on them. It's either going to be a pull cord or it's going to be a stopcock. The next piece is the alcohol evaporator. It's unlikely that in the state of New York or anywhere else in the United States, even the, the lower 48, maybe in Alaska, but you are not going to find an alcohol evaporator on a modern truck. Unless it's working in sub-zero temperatures, they're just not going to have alcohol evaporators. However, for the purposes of the test, the question that you need to know about alcohol evaporators, you need to use manufactured approved methyl hydrate in the alcohol evaporator on the air brake system. Essentially what these things do is you put uh, methyl hydrate into the alcohol evaporator, it lowers the freezing point of water and reduces the chances of any vapor or water inside the air brake system causing it to freeze up. Like I said, not likely you're gonna see one unless you're working in Alaska or in northern parts of Canada. Uh, most air brake systems are just not equipped with alcohol evaporators. All tanks are equipped with a safety valve to release pressure or vacuum if it gets too high. In the purposes of an air brake system, the safety valve will blow off at 150 pounds per square inch. The safety valve blows off and sounds like a machine gun. And you'll know it's the safety valve blowing off. When that happens, you can take the vehicle into your mechanic and authoritatively say there's something wrong with the governor or the compressor, most likely the governor. Brake pedal on a large commercial vehicle controls the service brakes. Make sure that you have the parking brakes released before you apply the service brake or the brake pedal because you don't want to compound the brakes. All modern air brake systems are equipped with anti-combating valves which will release air pressure and not allow the service brakes to be applied when the spring brakes are on. However, 
purposes of a road test, purposes of a air brake test, do not compound the brakes. So make sure that you have the parking brakes released, the, boot, the yellow and the red button pushed in before you put your foot on the service brake. Service brake is essentially the same as a hydraulic brake. It does have back pressure. It'll feel a little bit different. And depending on what truck or bus you get into, some are gonna come on automatically and some are not. The harder you push down on it, the more air pressure you apply to the brakes, the greater the brake application. Most brake applications for the purposes of driving, normal driving, are gonna be made at less than 10 pounds per square inch. Very little air pressure required to apply air brakes on a large commercial vehicle. The brake pedal on a large commercial vehicle, an air brake equipped vehicle, works the same as the brake pedal on your car. You push down on the brake pedal and the brakes are applied, you release the brake and the brakes release. One of the differences is that in an air brake equipped vehicle you're going to get some brake lag. From the time that you put your foot on the brake to the time that the brakes applied there's going to be a slight delay. Not really noticeable but in the beginning it's going to be a little bit weird. As well there's also a brake lag from the time that you release the brake to the time that the brakes actually release. So note that there's a term called brake lag and you're probably going to get tested on that for the purposes of your air brake test. The other difference in an air brake equipped vehicle is, is that if you pump the brakes going down a hill, after you make a service brake application, the air that you use to make a brake application is evacuated from the system through the quick release valve. It reduces brake lag in the system by evacuating the air and as well air can only go one way in the line so we can't bring it back into the system we simply evacuate it into the atmosphere so know that if you pump the brakes going downhill you're going to lower the air pressure and you may run out of air pressure and not have enough air pressure to apply the brakes once you get to the bottom of the hill proper braking technique in an air brake equipped vehicle hard short intermittent brake application so hard brake application bring your road speed down five miles per hour let it run back up hard short brake application. This way you won't fan the brakes, you won't lose air in the air brake system and it's the proper braking system. In combination with engine brake technology, if you were in the right gear and going down the hill in the right gear and see the video here on proper downhill braking in modern air brake equipped vehicles, you shouldn't have to use the service brakes at all. However, if you do have to use the service brakes, hard short intermittent brake applications bring the road speed down five miles per hour and let it run back up again, hard short brake application. This way you won't run out of air and you won't overheat the brakes and create brake fade. Brake fade is when you overheat the brakes and the shoes won't come in contact with the drum. I'll put a card up here for you on brake fade. Every system, regardless of whether it's a hydraulic system or whether it's an air brake system, suffer from the weakness of brake fade. So make sure that you don't get brake fade in this day and age and there's no reason why you should with modern engine brake technology. Next one is foundation brakes. The four types of foundation brakes on modern air brake systems are drum brakes or S-cam brakes, disc brakes, wedge brakes, and air over hydraulic brakes. These are the four types of foundation brakes. S-cam or drum brakes are the most popular. It's a drum and inside the drum is shoes and the shoes push out against the drums, create friction and heat and bring the vehicle to a stop. These are the most common. Disc brakes are better because they don't suffer from brake fade. However, the technology is not quite there yet for large commercial vehicles. Disc brakes are beginning to make inroads into air brake systems and large commercial vehicles, but technology is still in its beginning stages. And unfortunately, they're just not, uh, the technology is not advanced enough to absorb the sheer amount of heat that is generated in large commercial vehicles. So what happens is, is that if there's too much heat put to the disc brakes, it melts into a big pile of goo and your vehicle careens down a hill and you crash into a tree and die in a fiery inferno. So not really there, but it's coming. And the advantage of disc brakes is that they don't suffer from brake fade in the way that drum brakes do. Essentially, it's just a C-clamp over a, route, a rotor, as you can see here in the image. And essentially what happens is when you heat the brakes up, the rotor heats up and it actually expands into the brake shoes. This is why we use them on sports cars and high-end motorcycles because disc brakes actually work better when you heat them up. Air of a hydraulic was essentially a product of gas engines in the 1970s. Gas engines created vacuum and they were able to use that vacuum to create air over hydraulic brakes. If you have a vehicle that has air over hydraulic brakes, you will need an air brake ticket. And essentially what they've done is they've taken a brake chamber, attached it to a master cylinder, and come up with a hybrid system. So that's air over hydraulic. The last one is wedge brakes. 
and you'll know wedge brakes because instead of the brake chamber being perpendicular to the brake chamber, the SCAM brake chamber, it will be pointed into the brake chamber assembly. Wedge brakes, not very common. In all the years that I've been teaching air brakes and around big trucks, I've only seen a set of wedge brakes one time. The question on the test for the purposes of air brakes and wedge brakes may have one or two air brake chambers. The last thing I'll say about disc brakes and wedge brakes is that they are both self-adjusting and the driver cannot adjust them. They have to be adjusted by a qualified mechanic. Supply pressure gauges. All air brake equipped vehicles have pressure gauges to tell you how much pressure is in the air tanks. The question on the test is, what do the air pressure gauges tell you? They tell you how much pressure you have available for a service brake application. In the manual, they call them supply pressure gauges. The pressure gauges can be two gauges with one needle or one gauge with two needles. If they're uh, one gauge with two needles, one will be green, one will be orange for the most part. After time, they get faded and they kind of go more to white <laughs> as opposed to pink. Application pressure gauge tells you how much uh, air pressure you're putting to the brakes while you're applying the service brakes. Application pressure gauge, it's a great learning tool for new students, but for most drivers, you're not gonna be looking at the application pressure gauge while you're going up and down the road. It's kind of like some of the new sports cars that have G-force gauges in them. You're not gonna be looking at the G-force gauge while you're going around a corner. Hopefully, you're looking in the direction that you wanna go. Same with the application pressure gauge. Good for training, not so good when you're going up and down the road. In the state of New York, the low air pressure warning has to come on at 60 PSI or above. Now, it's visual and audible. All modern air brake systems have a light and a buzzer. There are some in the old days that had a wigwag, and you can see it here in the image. It was just up behind the visor. It was this wigwag thing that dropped down below you. The air pressure dropped below 60 pounds. Didn't really work out so well because the thing dropped down in front of a couple of drivers, scared the living daylights out of them. They careened off the road and crashed into a tree and died in a fiery inferno. And the engineers that designed the wigwag thought, oh, maybe that's not such a good idea. How about we just go with a light and a buzzer? So there might be wigwags. I've only seen a handful of them in my time. So most of them will have lights and buzzers. And as I say, 60 or above, it's not uncommon in an air brake system to see a low air warning come on well above 60. Stop light switch. That just tells you that the brake lights are gonna come on when you put your foot on the brake pedal. You don't really need to know what a stop light switch is. Just need to know that during your pre-trip inspection, you need to know that the brake lights are gonna come on and you need to check them as part of your pre-trip inspection during your CDL exam and every day when you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle. Front brake limiting valve. These are either manual or automatic. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, they were manual and it was simply a switch on the dash that went to dry or slippery. If it was raining out, you put it to slippery or wet. That reduced the braking power to the front wheels by up to 50% because we want the steer tires to in steer, not lock up and lose control of our steering. So this was the old manual ones and you can see an image of one here in the diagram. The new ones are all automatic, four, five, six up to 40 pounds. It reduces braking to the front steer axles by 50%. Between 40 and 60, there's kind of a gradation. After 60, it's equal to the front and the rear brakes of how much braking power there is in terms of the service brake. Spring brakes, as I talked about earlier, spring brakes are used for both parking and for emergency brakes. And spring brakes are used most commonly as parking brakes. When you park the vehicle, you pull out the buttons on the dash, it evacuates the air from the spring brake chambers at the rear of the vehicle because we don't have spring brakes on the steer tires. Spring brakes. Spring brakes are used for parking and for emergency brakes. In normal applications, the spring brakes are used for parking and they're best used for parking. The spring brakes use all the same linkage and foundation brakes as the service brakes. The only difference is, is that it's the power source that applies the brakes now. So if the service brakes are out of adjustment, the spring brakes are also out of adjustment. That is potentially a question on the test. If the service brakes are out of adjustment, so too are the spring brakes. And if the spring brakes are out of adjustment, so too are the emergency brakes because the spring brakes, the parking brakes, and the, the emergency brakes are one and the same thing. Going up and down the road, those large powerful springs are held in the released position by air pressure. If there's a loss of air pressure in the system, the springs will begin to come on at 60 pounds per square inch. They actually begin to activate and between 20 and 45 pounds will come on automatically. 
know that once the low air warning comes on at 60 pounds or above, you need to get that vehicle pulled over to a safe place and figure out why you have an air loss. So question for the test, when will the spring brakes apply? Between 20 and 45 PSI is the question on the test that you will be asked. Parking brake controls. There's two valves on the dash. The parking brake control valve, which is yellow and four-sided, as you can see here in the image. The other one is the trailer supply valve. It supplies air to the trailer. And, and the engineers actually got that one right. It's red, it's octagon, and it says right on it, unless it's an old truck, it'll be worn out, but it says right on it, trailer supply valve. Push the buttons in on a truck to release the parking brakes, pull them out to evacuate the air from the spring brake chambers and apply the parking brakes. Now, if you're driving a transit bus, it may be reversed. So if you become a transit bus driver, it's gonna be re reversed because it's not the same setup on a transit bus is it, as it is on coaches and other uh, vehicles. And again, in the manual, they say here not to compound the brakes, which simply means that you need to release the parking brakes before you put your foot on the service brakes. Now, just saying that, don't be afraid to put, make a light brake application before you release the parking brakes. That's fine. That's not gonna hurt anything as long as it's you know less than 10 pounds. So just a slight application onto the service brakes, release the parking brakes so the vehicle doesn't roll backwards because when you do your road test in a large commercial vehicle manual transmission, know that you can't roll backwards on a start, otherwise that's an automatic fail. Modulating control valve, I've never seen one. I teach it in the air brake course and all of the modulating control valve tells you is, is that if you lose air pressure in the system and your vehicle gets stranded on the middle of the road, it's a button that you can use to apply the spring brakes in the same way that service brakes would be applied and it's for the purposes of getting a vehicle off the road onto the side of the road. The reality is you're not gonna find it on an air brake equipped vehicle anymore, but it's in the manual, you need to know it and that's why they put it in there, modulating control valve. Dual parking control valve. Some vehicles, as they say in the manual here, such as buses, have a separate air tank that is a reserve air tank in the event that you lose your air brakes. You can hold the switch in. It's usually a dead man switch, which means you gotta hold it in the whole time. And again, it's for the purposes of getting your vehicle off the road into a safe place so you're not stranded on the road and you're not presenting a danger to other traffic. Again, never seen one of these. They're in all the manuals. So somewhere in the world they exist, but for the purposes of the road test, you simply need to know that it's a dead man switch, dual parking control valve, and allows you to get your vehicle off the road. Anti-lock braking systems have come into the commercial industry in the last 10, 15 years. They're the same as what happens on cars and light trucks. Instead of making threshold braking and the, having the wheels lock up, these prevent the wheels locking up and allow you to continue to steer and maintain control of the vehicle. You'll know that the vehicle that you're operating has ABS on it because when you turn the key to the on position, wait for a moment for all the check engine lights and the system to do a diagnostic, the ABS light will come on momentarily and then go out. That tells you that the system is working normally. If the ABS light comes on, stays on, the ABS is not working normally, but this doesn't mean that you don't have brakes. When the ABS fails and that light stays on, the brakes simply revert to normal brakes. So you don't have ABS anymore and you can potentially lock up the wheels. That's how you know you have ABS. I've never seen an ABS system fail. Maybe some of the older ones, but the newer ones I've never seen ABS fail. In some cases, the ABS, all of the systems, the CPU and the sensors and the wheels that detect wheel spin and those types of things will be used for ATC automatic traction control. So if they detect wheel spin on one side, they'll cut power to the motor and direct uh, power to the other side of the truck or bus. ATC uses the same uh, components uh, as the ABS system and the two interact and work together. A Couple other things about ABS that you might need to know. Some older vehicles, the light may not go off until the vehicle gets higher than five miles per hour. So if the light stays on and you get the vehicle rolling and the light goes out, then that means that the ABS are working normally. The last thing you need to know about ABS is they are not gonna stop you in a shorter distance. That just doesn't happen. So know that you got ABS and they're not gonna stop you in a shorter distance. Now, if you activate the ABS, you make a hard, firm brake application, hold the brake pedal down, shuttering, grinding, unusual noises, all of that's normal on an ABS uh, equipped vehicle. If you haven't activated ABS before in your vehicle, take your personal vehicle out onto a back side street somewhere, 
get it up to 20 or 30 miles an hour, make a hard, firm hold the brakes on and get used to what ABS feel like because they're very different than other types of brakes. There's actually grinding, pushback, lots of noise, and it sounds like the vehicle's coming apart. All of that is normal for ABS brakes. Review questions, turn the video off, answer the questions, come back, and we'll go over the review questions together. We must drain air tanks daily to get rid of water and other contaminants in the system to prevent freezing and contamination of the system. This is why your tanks have to be drained daily. Purpose of the supply pressure gauge, it tells you how much air pressure is in the air tanks and it tells you how much pressure you have available for a service brake application. Most service brake applications are going to be made at less than 10 pounds per square inch and if you're making a brake application over 20 pounds per square inch you're going to be doing a bug impression on the windshield so make sure you get your seatbelt on because anything over 10 pounds is an aggressive hard brake application in an air brake equipped vehicle. All vehicles equipped with air brakes must have a low air warning device. True or false? It is true. Every vehicle equipped with air brakes must have a low air warning device that activates at 60 or above. In this day and age, they're all going to be a light and a buzzer. There'll be a light on the dash and a buzzer. You're going to hear it. It's that most annoying sound in the world. <laughs> Don't worry. When the low air warning goes off. You'll know what it is. Some of the previous uh, air brake equipped vehicles back in the old days had some wigwags. Might be a question on the test about a wigwag. It was just a arm that came down from behind the visor. Unfortunately, it didn't work out so well. A few of them fell down, scared the crap out of a few drivers. They careened off the road, crashed into a tree, and died in a fiery inferno. So the engineers decided that ah, maybe a light and a buzzer. So true, all air brake equipped vehicles have a low air warning device. Next question, what are spring brakes? Springs, large powerful springs are used to activate the parking brakes and are best used for parking brakes. They're also used for emergency brakes. While the vehicle is going up and down the road, these large powerful springs are held in the released or caged position with air pressure. If there's loss of air pressure in the system, the spring brakes will come on automatically. A couple of questions that may be on the test. If the service brakes are out of adjustment, how does this affect the parking brakes or the emergency brakes? Because these large powerful springs use the same linkage as the S-cam brakes or commonly referred to as drum brakes, or the disc brakes, if those are out of adjustment, so too are the parking brakes and the emergency brakes. And that may be a question on the test that you encounter at the DOT office. So spring brakes are used for parking, best used for parking, also used for emergency. So if there's a loss of uh, air pressure in the system, the spring brakes will come on automatically. And the low air warning at 60 pounds per square inch is for a very specific reason, because at that point, the spring brakes actually start to begin to activate and this is why you need to get the vehicle off the road and onto a safe place as soon as that low air warning activates because you don't have very much time before the brakes are going to lock up on you. Front wheel brakes are good under all conditions. The answer oddly enough is true. Despite what, what technology is applied to the front steer axles to prevent lockup, ABS brakes, front wheel limiting valves, and the fact that there aren't spring brakes on the front steer axle, all of that would lead you to believe that a front wheel lockup is dangerous when in fact uh, skid pad tests have shown that rear wheel lockup is actually much more dangerous for the driver than steer axle lockup. So therefore, Front wheel brakes are actually good because as we know on cars and light trucks and other vehicles, the front brakes actually do most of the braking. They do 60 to 75, maybe even 80% of braking in really hard braking situations. And if you got the question wrong, <laughs> I too initially got the question wrong. And I would like to thank DC Fitness for pointing that out so that I could make amendments and bring you the best information possible. So front brakes are good under all conditions? The answer is true, but if you're driving a truck that has a manual front wheel limiting valve and it's slippery out, you can put it into the slippery position. Most of the front wheel limiting valves are automatic and most of the time you're not even going to know they're there. However, in a hard, 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 super hard brake application, more than 60 pounds, you're going to have equal braking to the front steer axles as you will to the back. So, front wheel brakes are good under all conditions? True. Two ways that you're going to know if the vehicle that you're driving is equipped with ABS brakes. First and foremost, you turn the key to the on position, let the system do its diagnostics check. All the lights will come on on the dash. 
So you let the check engine light come on, wait till it goes off, and then you can turn the engine on and start it up. At the same time the check engine light comes on and goes off, the ABS light will come on momentarily and then go off. On some older systems, the ABS light may come on and stay on until the vehicle attains five miles per hour, then it'll go off. The other way that you can tell that your vehicle has ABS brakes is the air line going out to the brake chamber will have an electrical line running along to it, usually zippy tied to it somehow. But there's an air line and there's an electrical line attached to it as well. So these are the two ways that you know whether your vehicle has ABS brakes or not. As well, the other question on the test, if the ABS light comes on and stays on, do you have brakes? Yes, you do have brakes. They revert to normal brakes. The wheels will lock up, you won't have ABS brakes, but those are the ways that you can tell that you have ABS brakes. If the light comes on and stays on, you can still operate the vehicle, you just need to take it to a mechanic and get it fixed as soon as possible. Quick review of the New York CDL Manual Section 5.1, which deals with the basic components, the fundamental components of the air brake system. Essentially, it talks about service brakes, parking brakes and emergency brakes and the only difference between hydraulic brakes and air brakes is the power source so for service brakes pushing down on the foot pedal when you're going up and down the road it is powered by air pressure in a hydraulic system it's pressured by hydraulic fluid on a air brake system when you apply the parking brakes and exhaust the air from the spring brake chambers it is these large powerful springs that apply the parking brakes indefinitely now in an emergency situation the same thing in your car you can pull up on the parking brake and bring the vehicle to a stop on an air brake system if there's a catastrophic air loss in the system the spring brakes will uh, expand because there's no more no longer air pressure in the system to keep them caged and they will apply the emergency brakes therefore you're going to go down the road and the vehicle is going to come to a screeching halt if you ignore the sound of the air loss if you ignore the low air warning <laughs> eventually uh, what's going to happen is those brakes are going to lock up automatically and you are going to come to a screeching halt the only failing of an air brake system in this day and age is brake fade all braking systems regardless of whether they are drum brakes disc brakes uh, cam laster brakes they all experience brake fade that's the only weakness left in any air brake system engine brakes uh, air tanks air gauges application pressure gauges uh, some of the valves this is all of the fundamental components of air brakes and of course there's some older technology and some redundancies that unfortunately you have to know for the purposes of the test manual front wheel limiting valves and wig wags you need to know what they are for the purposes of the test and after that you can forget them because in this day and age they are just you're not going to encounter them it's unlikely that you're going to encounter manual slack adjusters but just in the off chance you do need to know what they are and as well you need to know what uh, trailers are that aren't equipped with uh, spring brakes for the purposes of parking as well. You need to know some of this information about the older equipment, but for the most part, and I say in 98% of uh, cases, you can simply move on with modern dual air brake systems. So in the next section, I'll put a card up here for you in the corner, section 5.2 and 5.3, which essentially goes over the pre-trip inspection uh, that is required for the CDL uh, license requirements and how to do that uh, pre-trip inspection, what you need to do to check adjustment of the air brake system using the pry bar method and you're allowed one inch of free play. It's also called the free stroke method to check air brake adjustment on an air brake equipped vehicle and you will be required to do that as part of your CDL road test. Do an outside inspection, make sure all the components are good, secure, not damaged, not leaking and do the inside cab checks and the inside cab checks check the governor the low air warning ensuring that the spring brakes apply automatically between 20 and 45 psi build up a test which tests the compressor that it's able to build a prescribed amount of air in a set time check the maximum setting on the compressor and then the last test is to do a leak test and the tug tests on the parking brakes the spring brakes and then do a response test on the service brakes so that's the next section that you will need to know for the purposes of your cdl license question for my smart drivers which part of the air brake course have you found the most challenging is it the terminology the parts of the air brake system or is it the numbers that you need to know for the purposes of doing your pre-trip inspection for getting your air brake 
uh, ticket as part and parcel of your CDL license. Leave a comment down in the comment section there. All of that helps out the new drivers working towards getting their air brakes and their commercial license. I'm Rick with Smart Drive Test. Thanks very much for watching. If you like what you see here, share, subscribe, leave a comment down in the comment section as well. Hit that thumbs up button. Check out all the videos here on the channel if you're working towards a license or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. Lots of great information here as well. Head over to my website, lots of great information over there and online courses that you can purchase. Stick around to the end of the video, funny bits and links to the other videos and the great information that you can find both here and on my website. Thanks again for watching. Good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now. And yes, I had to redo this goofy video because I made a mistake in the video and the information was not correct for those of you watching the video. Thus, we're redoing it and making amendments in the information we're presenting to you.